Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Leah Anderson. I'm one of the organizers of One Million Cups Madison, and we're really happy to have you here today. Um, I just wanted to say a couple of things before we get started uh, with Nico's presentation of Redox. Um, first of all, I want to thank our sponsors. So Baker Tilly um, is the provider of our coffee this week from Crescendo. Um, so we really appreciate they've been our sponsor. Actually, this is their second of three months that they're going to be sponsoring, which is wonderful. So we really appreciate that. Also, we have on the video camera here, Field 59 has been providing their streaming services for us. And so We've been here at the library for almost a year, so we really are grateful to them as well. Um, just to a side note, this mic is actually for the uh, the live stream, so that's why it's not projecting my voice. So <clears throat> please help yourselves to coffee from Crescendo. Please also check out Crescendo. They're on um, Monroe Street in Madison. Um, otherwise, we're happy to be back. Happy New Year, and um, feel free to check us out online as well. We have a newsletter that we send out each week, and we're semi-active on social media. So um, with that, go ahead, Nico. Thanks for having me. I'm going to be standing here the entire time by the microphone. Um, so Redox has been around for about 18 months now. And uh, we normally we're here just smooching off the free coffee, but I told the organizers that if they ever need us to present, we'll be here in a heartbeat. So what I came to present today, I'm um, looking for feedback on three things. Um, the first one is uh, we're hiring a director of marketing. So we're looking for someone who can kind of take a strategic view on our brand and our company and how it's positioned in the industry and all of that. So as, as you hear about us and as you um, learn about Redox, keep that in mind if you know anybody, if you're thinking about uh, anybody who might fit that role. Um, the second thing is um, on Thursday, tomorrow, we're giving a webinar. And this is kind of a, a shift for Redox because for the longest time, at least uh, my efforts and presentations have been around pitching the company, right? Because we spent a lot of time raising money. Um, and for any company who's raised money in here, you know, when you're doing that, that's like your full-time job. Um, and so we, we raised two rounds of investment now. And um, most of our, our sort of pitch savviness has been around uh, investment pitches. And now we're really making a shift, as every company does, after um, you start getting customers to now we're starting to do, to, to do sales-oriented style pitching. So I'm really looking for feedback on, um, on, on that aspect, on the sales type aspect of our presentation. Um, so we're doing a webinar on Thursday, and this is the first webinar that we're doing like this, but it's really more of a educational webinar. So we sell to um, software vendors, and we're trying to educate them on the industry. So I'm going to uh, start with that piece of it, the webinar piece, which is really more of an educational piece around healthcare and around um, our landscape, which should give everyone kind of a baseline of um, why we exist as a company. Um, and then the third piece of feedback is uh, next week we're going to a big conference in San Francisco called Health 2.0 and we're pitching, uh, well we're giving a demo on the, on like the main stage in front of hundreds of people, which is really exciting, but we've never given a demo uh, in a crowd like that before, so I'm going to do the demo for you guys. Um, it's supposed to be a three minute demo, so I'm going to time it. and. Um, the weird thing about demoing an API is that it's really boring because like, it's like, data's over there. So um, I'm, I'm looking for feedback on if the, de if the demo was actually interesting at all or if it was applicable to people who might not be programmers and understand how to use or interact with an API. Um, so is that cool? Awesome. So this is our team. Um, we're, our office is right down, well, you can see it if you look out the window over here. But um, if you go down the door, we're, we always take a picture on State Street here. Um, we have 12 people now, which is mind-blowing to me. And by the end of the month, we'll have 14. Um, we're kind of continuing to grow slowly and bring on people that we, we like and we know and we trust. And um, it's starting to shift to a point where we're, we're needing to fill roles on the team. So uh, this is explicitly where we're now looking for a person to do marketing, which is before we never actually looked for people to do a role, it was more like we looked for awesome people and then they somehow fit into the company. So it's a little transition, which is why I'm looking for feedback on, um, on people you know or people who might be interested in that. Uh, we have our office dog in the picture there, Leroy. Um, he's great. Okay, so let's go into the webinar section of it, okay? So imagine you're sitting at your desk, you're watching a screen, you're doing email on your other screen, and I'm, I'm blabbling in this webinar, because that's how the webinars go, right? So the idea behind this is that um, we're, we're doing this webinar uh, jointly with another company that provides services to software vendors. So um, when you're starting a company in healthcare, um, when you're starting a health technology company, there are a few things that are very different about the healthcare industry uh, in comparison to starting uh, like an app or something that you're going to sell to consumers. 
Um, the first thing is HIPAA. You have to protect that data. You have to make sure that um, you do that in a certain way and the way you store that data is very important. So the other company that we're doing this with uh, does all that storage aspects and um, how to store it. So they're kind of going first and, first and saying, first things first, if you're going to start a healthcare company, you need to know um, about HIPAA and how to store your data appropriately. And then they kind of pass the mic to us and say, the second thing you might want to know is if you're going to start a healthcare technology company, you're probably going to want to use some of the data that the health system has um, access to. So if you want access to that data, uh, you should know and understand the EHR landscape, and the, that's the electronic health record. So uh, in town here, we have Epic, of course, our largest employer in Dane County. The most recent numbers were 9,400 employees. It's crazy. Um, when I started there, there was like 2,000 employees. How many people here used to work at Epic, by the way? Nice. See? Um, that's a, a typical demographic in Madison, right? Um, and, if, and if this was after 6 o'clock, we'd have like double that because most people who currently work at Epic are, are out there right now. Um, because of that demographic in Madison, we have a very unique landscape of people who know and understand um, not only the, the industry and how the industry uses that technology, but how that technology impacts doctors and nurses and um, providers within the healthcare system. So, um, real quick, like, what is an electronic health record? And it is electronic health record, not electronic medical record. Um, that was a decision that industry made a couple of years back on a whim. Um, really, the ONC, the Office of National Coordinator, part of the U.S. government, uh, started calling it health record. So we say EHR now, not EMR. Um, but this is their definition of it, a digital version of a paper chart, which is kind of a sad, um, sad definition for a piece of technology, right? It's like, well take the paper and put it in a computer. And so uh, that's how a lot of EHRs came to be was, well, we're writing down things on a clipboard, right? In the old movies, you see doctors with the clipboard looking at your chart. Um, how can we put that into a computer? And now instead of the, the doc holding a clipboard and taking all this type of data that they might in a, a, in a sort of patient-facing scenario, now they're looking at a computer and talking to you. So if anyone, you know, we've all been to the doctor and have seen the doctor and nurse type into the computer, that's the electronic health record. Um, and that's the part that, that you primarily interact with as a patient, but behind the scenes that, that does a lot of other things for the health system, including all the billing aspects, um, a lot of the logistics around uh, appointments and where patients are within a hospital or when a patient's gonna show up to uh, an ambulatory, you know, outpatient type visit. But these are the types of data that are in the electronic health record. So if you're building an application, and you might imagine a, an entrepreneur or a developer saying, like, it would be awesome to build an application that uses a patient's medication list, and I can remind patients when to take their medications. Right? Big problem, especially a lot of old people that have a ton of medications. You know, when to take what? What's the dose? You know, what if you got a push notification on your phone that does that? And so. Granted, that's not a very like novel idea, but there's a ton of companies out there trying to do just that. But in order to do effectively and efficiently, it'd be awesome if they could just pull the medical, uh, the medication list from the medical record. You know, UW already has it, GHC already has it for you. If we could pull that information out, then that, that application can run really efficiently and um, use the data that is already in there. It could also tell you, hey, it looks like GHC thinks you're taking this medication, but maybe you have no idea, right? So uh, it could help out with some of that reconciliation purposes too. So that's one example of the types of applications that um, we typically support and typically use this type of data. Um, so these are like our, our customers, the startups, the software vendors out there who are making those sorts of, uh, of applications. So uh, a little history on electronic medical records. Um, they were really, the f they were first thought of back in the 60s actually, um, what, like right as computers were started to, to computers and databases were being made. Someone said, well, why don't we put all of our medical information in this? And um, throughout that time, as, as things progressed, people started developing the electronic medical records. Epic was founded in 1979. Um, a lot of people who, who don't work, who never worked there didn't, don't know that, but it's been around for a, a long time and it kind of had a slow climb um, throughout the 80s and 90s until, um, really until the, the big shift in the industry was when the government put money behind it. The government said, we think that um, hospitals and doctor's offices should use electronic medical records, but they don't right now, so how do we incentivize that? And the program that they set out to do, it launched in 2010, was called Meaningful Use. And so you can see here after 2010, there's like a little uptick in the, the adoption. So these are doctor's offices that are using um, electronic health records. Um, 
I think I've I've now interchanged electronic medical records and health records a couple times after I just scolded everyone on it. Um, <laughs> right now, uh, 2014, 2015, into 16, um, it's it's right around 85, 90 percent of doctors' offices are using some sort of EHR. So it's it's pretty much we're in the the late adopters laggard section of the technology adoption curve. Um, how that breaks down um, is is like this. This is 2014. So all the people who took part in that meaningful use program, who took money from the government, they had to talk to the government about what electronic medical record vendor they were using because the government had to actually certify these vendors. Um, these are the different types of EMR vendors in the in the the doctor's offices space. So this is you know your primary care physician, your your family practice, um, you know the specialties, outpatient type. Facilities. So, as you can see, you know, Epic has a huge portion of this market, and Epic's typically working with the large um, health systems, large integrated delivery networks. Uh, a lot of these other uh, EMR vendors on here, eClinical Works and Practice Fusion, and Athena, Greenway, they supply EMR um, technology, EHR technology, to uh, smaller doctors' offices. So, like the, you know. S small rural one one to five doc practices and those sorts of people where a lot of medicine still takes place in the hospital space so right now about 97 percent of hospitals use some sort of EHR so it's very rare to find a hospital out there that is still on paper um, in the hospital space uh, the segmentation of the market is is isn't as um, as you know there's way more vendors on the on the outpatient ambulatory side um, than compared to the hospital side about 50% of the market is made up of, of, of Epic, Meditech, and CPSI. Um, Turner's another big one in there that's continuing to grow, and um, McKesson's another name you hear often. But as a software vendor, if you're developing software and you want to pull that medication list out of the chart, you have to think about all these different vendors because the way that the, the data is stored, it's not that, um, well, yeah, I have a cloud. So, most EHR implementations are on-premise, and what that means is all of those different vendors are um, installed literally in a data center that the health system manages. So it's not like, like Facebook, where the Facebook that you use is the same as the Facebook that I use, and Facebook is one thing in the cloud. Um, every single EHR implementation happens in a health system data center, oftentimes in the basement of that health system, stored on a server down there. Um, and they have a bunch of other systems down there. Their lab system, their um, you know, research systems, they have this interface engine that kind of ties it all together, but they manage that data center. It's not an AWS, it's not you know, Heroku in the cloud or anything. Um, whereas when you're building new software today, any modern software developer is going to look to build a cloud application. So your application's built in a, in a cloud environment. It's using the internet, right? Whereas the health system data center is not on the internet. It doesn't know what the internet is. It's in a basement. Um, it's on the intranet. If anyone works at big companies, you guys know what intranet is. Um, it's, it's behind that firewall. So when you're integrating with all of the different health systems that you're looking at, you have to actually integrate with each of the data centers. You're not integrating with the, the EHR vendor itself. So you don't plug into Epic to pull out all of the medication data for all the patients that you want to serve. You have to plug into every single one of the health systems. So for, for me in town, I've, I've had medical care at GHC, Dean, and UW in the six or so years I've been in Madison. So those three health systems have my data in it. So if I want to use an application to pull my medications out of those three health systems, the application vendor would have to hook up to three different data centers to access that data. They don't plug into Epic because Epic is not a centralized thing. It is out in Verona, but the software is in the basements of health systems around the country. And as we saw you know, back in a, a couple of slides, there's a lot of other vendors too. So it's not that a, a software vendor can crack the nut and say, I can integrate with Epic and therefore I can get 50% of the US population um, in, in my application. It's that you have to not only integrate with Epic, you have to integrate with Epic at UW, you have to integrate with Cerner at you know, Intermountain, uh, you have to integrate with that software vendor at that specific health system that you want to um, work with. And that's why the integration is such a problem for these applications. Um, we consider it one of the, the biggest Im impediments to innovation in the healthcare space. Um, if you can imagine, you know, all the applications that you have on your phone that will tell you about um, managing your schedule, right, or task management, or um, hanging out with your friends, or all the social media applications, if we had half or a quarter of that technology applied in the healthcare space, healthcare would be way more efficient and way more fun and way more engaging, right? But one of the problems is 
we, we can't develop those applications because of how difficult it is to, to make all these connections to the different health systems. Additionally, if you can connect up to all the different health systems, um, there's more problems. Um, health systems within their data, data center are using something called HL7. Um, this is a, a standard that was adopted um, about 30 years ago. They started developing it and implementing it at health systems. But what it does is it allows the different systems used within the data center to communicate with each other. So there's lab systems, you know, there's all these other different types of systems in the, the uh, within a health systems data center and they use HL7 to communicate and the interface engine um, that box in the middle there it processes that that message so anytime something happens in the medical record like a doctor orders a drug for you or um, you're, you schedule an office visit to go see your doctor what happens is the scheduling system which is typically part of the electronic health record sends a, a message out in in an HL7 format and it says um, it says you know James is going to see the doctor James never goes to the doctor, by the way. <laughs> um, so it says James is going to see the doctor. The, the interface engine takes that, that message and it, it sends it off to all the other systems that need to know about it. The billing system, the, um, the you know, whatever other systems are in there. And that interface engine um, allows the health system to customize the, um, the HL7. So th these are a bunch of different types of HL7 messages. And for any developers in the room, like this box is a scary thing because it's a very like ugly and complex way to to sh like to show data to display um, the data. Um, there's no labels on any of the data in here. You know, you can see like this says Jones, Jane, Lee, but there's no there's nothing telling you here. Like, is that first name, middle name, last name, or last name, first name, middle name? You know, there, there, it's it's very difficult to decipher what this data actually means, um, and this is this is what developers have to deal with. The other challenge here is that that format, if this is first name, middle name, last name, that format might be different at the uh, the next health system or the next EHR vendor because it's configured at the health system and at the EHR level. So even if you can understand what the heck you're looking at here, it changes so frequently that you have to get new specifications at every single health system you go to. So for a software developer who's awesome at building a really great iPhone app, you know, that's a very specialized skill set. That person does not know how to deal with this stuff. And that's one of the challenges here is that the best developers in the world don't know how to do this integration because it's such a, a weird and specific thing in healthcare and it's so fragmented that even if you learn it once, you have to recreate the wheel at every single health system you go to. So if you're if you're selling your application, like if you if you're going to the health system and you say, uh, "Hey, GHC, I have this great app that can help you with all of your your patients who are taking all these medications. We're going to help you get, help your patients stay on their their medication treatment plans." And so you're trying to sell that application into GHC. So that's that's often the problem that our customers are facing is they're going to health institutions and saying, "We are selling you an application." Um, this is kind of some best practices that we've learned when our applications are going to sell. Um, the first thing that you need is kind of the first bullet point. You need check boxes there to say that you are HIPAA compliant. Like sometimes they don't even ask you because they assume, but you need to have that sort of in the bag, which means that um, you know th there's a bunch of different ways to do that, but you need to to know that you can be HIPAA compliant. And that's kind of going back to the first part of the webinar that you didn't see. The second thing is you need to tell them you can integrate because oftentimes they'll say, "Well, if you can't get the data out of our system, then we're not." going to use you because it's going to be too much of a headache for a patient to input the data or for one of our employees to input the data. Um, so if you're trying to, to make this sale, you have to have an integration strategy down pat and you have to, they have to believe that you can actually do it because health systems have seen um, these projects start up and fail and become, you know, go from a one month thing to a 10 month thing very quickly. So um, you kind of have to have those strategies in the back. Um, we help people develop those strategies. We also suggest that you do this this land and expand um, model when you're you're selling an integrated product, and that's if you think about the medication application, right? If they can get a medication list out of the the EHR, that's sort of one piece of data, right? The the list of medications. But it would be really cool if that application could also get all of your future appointments. It maybe it would be cool if that application could help you communicate with your physician and ha ask questions about your medication. So there's all of these different things that developers think of when they they think of all of the awesome functionality that they want to provide to their patients. Um, but we suggest start with something small and then expand outward at, after you get live at that health system. And that really helps the health system kind of get over the, um, 
the, the thought that your project's going to be really big and cumbersome, um, which kind of gets to the next point of we need to limit the IT resources. So if you're selling an application to a health system, you, you're not, you don't want to sell them a project. You want to say, this is will work out of the box. We're HIPAA compliant. We have an, an integrated strategy. Your IT team, who is overburdened, you know, very, uh, very stressed out people, uh, we're not going to need a lot of work out of them. Um, we want to limit the exposure that IT will have to, you know, limit the number of bodies IT will have to throw at the project. Um, so it's another piece of kind of limiting down the scope. Um, the other big piece of it is we want a clinical champion in the sense that there needs to be a doctor, or nurse, or department head, or someone like that who's going to say, this medication application is going to actually save lives and reduce costs within our health system. Um, and you're not going to get through the hurdles that the health system throws at you until you, you have a champion on the inside that, you know, after you leave your pitch meeting, walk out the door, you need that person still there fighting for you because that person's going to be going to all the meetings internally, the committee meetings to discuss this. Um, and then one thing that, that uh, may seem obvious, but we, we've seen uh, software vendors get burned on this, is, is not training the actual users. Um, so a lot of times software developers are creating apps, right? If you think about any website you've been to or any app you've downloaded on your phone, it didn't come with a person that, that showed up at your door and trained you on how to use it, right? You just kind of opened it and it said, hey, click this button and figure out what happens, right? Um, that's how most modern software developers think about software is like it should work and it should be intuitive. Um, the people who work in health systems, they are, aren't only using your software, they're using Epic, they're using Outlook, they're using a whole suite of things, and it all fits within a workflow. And if you don't tell them how your software fits in their workflow, even if your software is super easy to use, if you don't say, this is when you actually open up our application and use it, they're not going to use it. And we've seen people go live at health systems um, after you know the health systems invested lots of money in it, and, and their users are just like, I didn't even know that thing existed. Um, and I, you know, even if I did, I wouldn't know when to use it. So. It's a, it's a kind of obvious point, but it's something that's really important for uh, a lot of new software developers is make sure you actually train the people that are supposed to use the thing so they, they know when to use it. This is high level on how Redox actually works, by the way. Um, so instead of the application in the cloud having to, to manage all of the connections and manage all of the, um, the translations between the different formats of HL7 and other sorts of interfaces that are at health systems, uh, we take on that burden. So um, our software can communicate with applications uh, using modern web services, using the same uh, strategies that modern software developer, developers like to use when they're communicating with other applications. So have you ever logged into an app and um, like logged in with Google and it said, uh, Google, well, you know, this app wants to access all of your contacts because maybe the app wants to fill out the contacts in it, right? And you're like, okay, cool. Um, the same way that that application communicates with Google, or if you've done the same thing with Facebook or uh, any other thing that you've logged in with, the same way that those applications communicate with each other is the same way that we can communicate with applications. So uh, modern software developers are really used to using that functionality. It's over HTTPS, the internet. Um, it uses JSON, which is a, um, a, a nice, simple way, very structured and labeled, consistent way of displaying data. So instead of Jane Lee Jones, ours would say first name Jane, middle name Lee, last name Jones, like, so it's very clear and easy to understand. Um, and then when the applications go to sell into a health system and go to GHC, they can say, hey GHC, we know how to integrate, we know how to pull out that medication list from you guys, um, and our partner at, at Redox will do that for us. Um, so th that's all they have to know. And then we hop in and say, this is exactly how we do it. And this is uh, why you can trust us. We all used to work at Epic. We did this professionally while we worked at Epic. Um, we know your system inside and out. We know how to make it so your IT team doesn't have to do work. And we do it in a way that Epic's not going to get pissed at us for it or pissed at you, um, which is a, a real concern. Um, we also maintain those connections. So when the health system upgrades their EHR or when they change something and the connection breaks, uh, we're the ones who get up in the middle of the night to fix that. That's probably what James is doing right now, um, fixing connections that might uh, need updating. Um, so that's, that's our job. And so what this really is, is it allows the application to focus on what they're good at, making a really great application, and it allows us to specialize um, on, on helping them scale, right? They can go health system to health system, make their sales, and not have to do the work of connecting up to, uh, you know, the, all that infrastructure in place and all that um, uh, support needed to maintain those connections. And all that specialized knowledge, too. Without, without someone in the middle helping you do this, if you hire a consultant to do it, uh, consultants will charge between twenty and $40,000 per connection to help you set that up. Um, and so it, this is just a, a much more efficient process. And I kind of th think of it as, uh, if you think about back in the day, um, 
like back in you know 80s or 90s I don't even know when this happened probably 90s um, if you were to make a website like you'd have to actually host the website on a server in your office and if someone comes by and kicks that server and it falls over or um, it turns off your website goes down um, and so people would have to build redundancies and they'd have to build a whole bunch of servers in their office and then someone said well why don't we just centralize this um, put all of them in one place and then you focus on building your awesome website and then we'll focus on making sure the servers don't go down. Um, and it's a similar sort of thing in that we want people to focus on building their awesome application and we'll make sure that your connections into these health systems don't go down. You can communicate with us the same way you do with Google or Facebook or LinkedIn or whatever. Um, so, yeah. This is some of the data that we make available to, um, to the applications. So there's a bunch of different things in here, but Essentially, what we what we did over the last year or so, as we've been growing as a company, is listening to these software vendors. We've talked to over a thousand different companies across the country, um, and we say, "What what do you guys do?" And then you know they tell us about their their dream of um, helping helping to make sure patients take their medications on time. And from a story like that, we can say, "Okay, it'd be cool if you had the medication list, and it'd be cool if you had you know um, new new." Uh, vaccinations that a patient might have for some reason, I don't know. But we basically can help them understand what data they might need from a health system. Um, and from that, we've developed these different data models that uh, will support those different workflows for these for the patients. Not for the patients, for the applications that uh, need to use that data. Um, cool, so that's kind of where, where the, the webinar kind of ends. It's you know mostly on the education side. and. Um, uh, you know, we get into kind of what Redux says in the end, but I'm going to open up our uh, our website now and do the demo. Ba -bum. Cool. Maybe we'll make this bigger. Okay. So we're switching gears now. Now imagine you're at a conference. You have a coffee and a bagel, and um, someone does an, an introduction. He has an English accent, because that's the guy that's going to do our introduction has an English accent. And he's been spending the past five minutes ranting about why integration's a problem, much like I just did. And he says, now I want to welcome to the stage Nico from Redox, who's going to describe how their product can help out with it. Thanks, Bill. <laughs> oh, yeah, and uh, we're supposed to time it, because it's only supposed to be three minutes. Hey guys, thanks for having me today. Um, at Redox, we help software vendors integrate with uh, with health systems across the country. Um, you can see a lot of the examples of these different software um, applications on our gallery here. Um, we allow our, our applications, once they're integrated with us, to make themselves public so uh, software other software vendors can communicate with them, as well as health systems who might be installed with, with Redox can turn any of these applications on with the flip of a switch. Um, We'll take one of these guys for example, so you can, you know, put some context around it. Gauss Surgical is a really cool application that um, they actually have a, an iPad app. We'll go to their website. There's their iPad. It sits in a, an operating room, and when um, someone's getting operated on, they lose a lot of blood, right? And so what their iPad does is a medical assistant takes pictures of anything that gets bloody. Blood on the floor, blood on the gown, blood in a sponge, blood in a canister. And their application is FDA cleared to measure how much blood loss a patient has, right? Um, so all they need is those pictures of uh, the blood and the blood lab values to know how dense the blood is. And then they say the patient's lost 10 milliliters of blood and they send that um, back into the medical record. So Redox facilitates that, that exchange of data. So we tell them how much, like the blood lab values, the hemoglobin values, and then we take that the blood loss value and we put that back into the medical record. So the doctor and the nurse and anyone who's looking at that surgery can say the patient lost 10 milliliters of blood during this surgery. Maybe they need a blood transfusion or maybe they don't. Um, so, Gauss came to us and uh, we said, cool, we can help you with that problem. We set them up on our dashboard. Um, and the first thing that it, they did was they went in here and they configured their, their endpoint. So they went in and said, cool, Gauss says endpoint. They say, we want our data in JSON. Um, we're going to use the API. And um, they configure this endpoint here. So for any developers out there, you know how to make an endpoint and configure it. Um, this is a sample one that we created. And um, once, they, once they plug it in here, they put in a token. The token is part of the security process, so when we exchange data with them, we also exchange this token, and they verify and save it. Success! 
So now that they're up and running, their endpoint can actually start receiving data from Epic. Um, and from, from Redox through, well, from Epic to Redox into their endpoint. Um, this is what the endpoint looks like just for, uh, for display purposes. We, we made the sample one so you can kind of see this is just a list of messages that have come through. Um, and so what's interesting about this is through our development tools, they can actually start pretending like they're already connected to the, to the health system on the other side. They can go in here and say, you know, we're going to get results data from the EHR. We want new results to come in. We have a patient named Timothy, uh, Dr. Pat Granite here, and we're going to uh, find results from a first trimester screen. This is what our data looks like for the, the developer here and what that um, our results data model looks like for, for these results. So you can clearly see this is who the patient is. And um, this is the, the actual results of that um, test. So it looks like um, this person is unfortunately positive for cystic fibrosis. Um, this is sample data, by the way. Um, so we send that off, and that message actually goes over to this endpoint here. Um, maybe refresh. Ta-da, there it is. So this is the, the data that moved over. That's like the, the magic of data going from left hand to right hand through an API. Very boring. <laughs> um, the other interesting thing here that uh, our software vendors like to look at is in our documentation they can really kind of dig in and see all the different types of data that we can exchange. Um, so we just looked at what results look like but you know there's a ton of other things in here including um, all sorts of summary data about a patient so any allergies they may have had or their medication list and in here they have uh, their data dictionary and um, sample data so they can start to understand what this data looks like coming out of the medical record. They can start building their application to receive this data and send this data so that way they, um, when they're ready to go and approach a health system to um, sell their integrated product, they have a strategy that not only um, the health system can uh, use, it is also, you know, works in, in a fully integrated fashion with their application. So. Um, you can see a bunch more examples here of different applications that have done this. Since October, every single cesarean section at Hackensack uh, University Medical Center in New Jersey used Gauss technology to uh, measure blood loss on uh, mothers who were giving birth, um, which is th really the reason why we get up every day in the morning is because that application that is powered through the, the interface that we made is now making it safer for mothers and saving lives for, for mothers who are having complex births. Um, so that's what we do at Redox, and if you're interested at all, um, go to our website. You can log in and do all of that stuff in there, um, or come find me afterwards. Thank you. Five minutes? Ah! Okay, fir first piece of feedback needs to be a lot shorter. Okay, cool. That's all I had planned for us today. Um, I would love questions and feedback on those three pieces. Yes? Can you integrate with that particular device and capture the results and then download it to the uh, to the hospital? Or to the yeah. So their application. Um, so you're saying the application? They also have a device. Is it their device or are they using someone else's device? It would be their their device. Yeah. In, so in the realm of like telemedicine, being able yeah, to yeah, yeah. So yeah, we can take that data that that device is capturing and put that into the medical record. And even if the medical record doesn't have a field for that, you know, because the the EMR, as I showed in that presentation, right, only it only has certain data that it expects to receive. But we have the ability to actually create new fields. So something like. Um, like step count, for instance, is not a field like, you know, how many steps you took in a day. Like, that's not a thing that doctors typically care about. But sometimes maybe the health system will want to say, how many steps did a patient take? We can put discrete data like that back into the medical record. So the same thing with the device. Um, it'll say, this is the measurement and this is the number, and we can send that back in. And the device, if it had like a SIM card, I mean, what kind of technology does the device have to have in order to capture that data? I mean, we need to be connected to the internet. So a SIM card should do it. Um, and if it's, if it's connected to the internet, you know, the application would store, they would first store that information in their database, and then their integration with Redox would, would say how it gets from their database into um, the, the EHR. Yeah, Wes? In your demo, I, um, I don't know if you said this, or maybe I, maybe I missed it, but um, 
you explained how Gauss needed uh, the technology to access the data and to deliver the data, mm -hmm. um, but you didn't really speak about like why your relationship um, made it possible for them to do that, that working with Redox relationally made it easier to sell to the hospital that needed yeah. this critical piece of technology. Um, so I'd make sure that like somehow you explicitly say that and yeah. really clear and maybe leave a little bit of room on, on the front end and back end, end of that so people like really get like not only that you're making things technically um, yeah, possible yeah. but relationally possible. Um, and also the second piece on that is that um, you said it, it should be at least applicable to people that don't yet have the knowledge of like this is why all this stuff works. Yeah. And I think like really quickly getting into the data model makes it hard for me as a designer that understands it. Like I don't understand the data. So it made it a little hard for me to understand like why what you're doing is so important. So if like you can relate the API to things that like people do actually understand, um, because most people know why APIs work, they just don't know it from a data perspective. Mm. So yeah. Right. Cool. That's awesome. Thank you. Other questions, comments? Nico, can you explain what his first comment meant to you? Yeah. So his uh, his, his comment around um, how we actually help Gauss make that sale. Yeah. So, um, and, and actually this, this, this quite literally happened when Gauss approached the health system that they were selling to. They said, we have this really great iPad app that can measure blood loss. And the health system's like, awesome, we want that data in our medical record. And Gauss said, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> we, we make this awesome application that measures blood loss. Um, so from that process, with us talking to Gauss, we, we can help them design, like this is exactly what you say when the health system asks you, how are you gonna get that data in? You say, we're, we're working with Redox, we use this interface channel, this is how much time it's gonna take from your IT team, this is what the project plan looks like. Um, you know, from, from kickoff to go live, like this is how we're going to implement our product with your organization. Um, that alone gives Gauss the sort of muscle they need to get over that barrier when they're selling to the health system. The health system can now say, oh, you, these guys have, have it figured out. Um, let's do it. And so that's something that um, is really valuable to these companies who you know, make an amazing application, right? They had to know a bunch of machine learning algorithms and stuff like that to make that awesome iPad application, but now they don't have to know anything about integration or, or how to actually work with the health system's IT group. So the health system IT doesn't care if, if you, Redox, are in the middle or someone else, one of your competitors necessarily? Yeah, as long so, as that works, right? Yeah. The, Health systems are used to using a middle person for this because it's such a specialized task that um, they typically expect some consultant or someone to, to be helping a company with the integration process. So having Redox or someone like that in the middle is typically not a, not a concern for the health system. Who are your main competitors right now? There's a, there's a couple of different classes of people who are solving this problem. So I mentioned earlier you can hire a consultant to do it. So that's kind of the traditional way. Um, there are those interface engines that I had in that diagram that um, are starting to move into outside of the firewall into the cloud. So that's another sort of group of people. These are like bigger incumbents. Um, and then there's a new wave of startups who are trying to tackle this problem from a, a modern perspective, the way that we're doing it and, and other groups like that. Other feedback for Nico and Redux? No? Can you say a little bit more about why you haven't capitalized on Red Ox as like a mascot? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, <laughs> Drew, Drew asked me earlier, like, why isn't there a red ox? And we actually have this uh, this bear here. You can see our little bear guy. Um, and there's some stickers over here if you guys want any. But um, our designer, like, when we first launched our website, put this bear in it, and we were like, aw, bear. Um, so so we like we like the bear. We named her Candy. And um, and and we, we don't use red ox because it's 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 pronounced redox, and so we don't want to get people confused, right? Um, but when you do something wrong on the website, like if you, you go to a link that's bad, or if you try to go to like blah, 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 um, you actually do get a red ox. Um, and it's, so, so the, the, the red ox is the, the ant antithesis to, the, to our candy the bear. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, as a designer, you know the answer to that question. <laughs> yeah, so. Um, yeah, if you could do that, that'd be great. <laughs> so as a company that's, I mean, intimately EHR adjacent, and, I mean, you guys have all been involved with Epic, do you see any of the big EHR companies emerging as, like, the lion in that 
industry? I mean, is is Epic going to take over? Is, is there any oh, as far as the the um, kind of the enterprise system? Yeah, models? yeah. Well, so so as as you saw in those graphs I showed earlier, it's the industry is still pretty fragmented in um, the t types of EHRs that are out there. Um, one of the interesting industry trends that we're seeing is that we're s we're starting to see not as many like small doc doc practices anymore. Like back in the day, right? It was like the the one doctor who had his office who came and did a home visit with a stethoscope, right? Like those guys are are for the most part non-existent anymore, and the small doctor practices are starting to be acquired and merged into a large integrated delivery network. So it's kind of an industry trend that we're seeing. And so one of the things that goes along with that is the EHRs that are supplying those small providers are now being replaced by the EHRs that pr that supply the large integrated systems, right? Um, so that's how that's how Epic and Cerner and a lot of these big EHR vendors are starting to get a lot of their new businesses from um, the small doc practice is kind of moving into the um, into the large enterprise space. So um, you know we're seeing that 90% of the the industry already has a record. So there's not many people who are out there saying like I need a new medical record. Um, but we are seeing people who who are being kind of shifting into that as the industry is changing and. You know, people are sh they they do buy a new medical record like once every ten years or so. So um, you do see some turnover, but um, as far as that goes, it's really kind of the industry trends that are are shifting it. Um, and you and you see Epic put a lot of their effort on kind of moving down from the larger systems to the smaller systems now, and also moving internationally. So you're seeing a lot of growth um, with with Epic as well as a lot of the other EHR vendors now supplying the technology internationally. Um, Canada, for instance, has a much highly more frag well, uh, higher fragmentation of their EHR market, and are definitely shopping. Um, so you mentioned it's like sort of like an Easter egg in your presentation. You mentioned that uh, hospital systems could turn on apps that you have currently in your gallery with the flip of a switch. Yeah. Does that mean that the future of Redox is really taking more of a strategic position towards like App Store for the healthcare market? And what does that mean for companies like mine that don't need a hospital partner but are, are looking for access to data? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So we, through the, the infrastructure that, that we're putting in place at the various health systems that we implement at, um, it, it allows a health system who's looking to buy an application, uh, if they're plugged in with Redox, turning these applications on are, are a non-event. They can go in here and say, you know, I want to. I want an application that does like emergency, um, that helps out with the emergency department. We have a couple here. They can go and read about it. And if they're plugged in with Redox, they can flip this thing on. And actually, this one requires some hardware to be installed, but um, it's really easy for them to do that. And and that's a, a huge benefit both on the health system side as well as for the software vendors that are working with us. So it's something that we we absolutely play up. Um, but we, what we say that we don't do and will never do is is be a marketplace in the sense that we are going to start skimming revenue off the top of these guys. We have our standard fees that we charge to help them exchange data, and that's fine. Um, and they understand why why that's valuable. But we're not going to be like the iTunes store that takes thirty percent of the the applications that are using it. Um, with us, really, it's it's. Uh, our gallery currently is really about showing the diversity of applications that are on here. Um, one of the limitations to applications like yours is that you're working directly with patients and with consumers, and you don't need a health system partner. Um, whereas I think the people who are, are going to be most interested in um, our gallery and working with these applications are the health systems themselves, um, because these are that sort of applications that sell into the enterprise. Um, eventually, if we get to a point in the future where um, one of the things that, that we, we have sort of a solid stake in the ground on is we believe that a patient should have access to their, their medical record data, and they should have access to that data in an API format, which what that means is that in the future, if, this, if the world existed like that, you could download an application on your phone, pull your data down from UW, and have it power that application that's on your phone. And as a patient, you should have the ability to do that. Currently, that doesn't exist. And in the future, when that does exist, I think that those applications will just go on the typical marketplaces that are already out there, right? Your your iTunes and your, your Android marketplaces. You mentioned uh, international. Are you working with any um, international partners? Yeah, so we actually, um, we have this kind of harkening back to our days at Epic. Um, Epic has a has a map, and every time they like get a customer, they they say where the customer is, and they kind of start painting. And so we started doing the same thing, except we we paint the country green instead of in red, how they did it at Epic. Um, and yesterday, 
it was actually yesterday we went live with a customer who um, the health system's in the states, but the application vendor that we're supporting is in Edinburgh in Scotland. Um, so we we had to sort of add Scotland to the map, which we got a map of America. So it was hard to hard to do that. Um, so so yeah, they were they were our first uh, person internationally that we're working with. Um, I think you know we're totally open to uh, su supporting health systems internationally as well, but we get into some um, complications with where the data is kept. So we're hosted in the cloud in the United States. Uh, a lot of countries have laws that if you're going to work with, with the di um, sensitive data like health data, it needs to be hosted within their the walls of their country. Um, so we'll have to kind of, it's a big step for, for a cloud hosted company to try to figure out how, okay, how do we support an infrastructure that can host data not only in the United States, but also have instances in Canada and in UK and other places like that in Australia. Um, but for software vendors who are selling in the United States, it doesn't matter where they are, and that's you know the company Edinburgh that we're working with. Great, thank you so much, Nico and Field Fifty Nine, Baker Tilly, and all of you for coming out. Um, just by way of announcement, we're having a, another legal roundtable next week. I'll be presenting on some legal startup topic, TBD. Yeah, nice uh, yeah you know, I mean, we gotta <laughs> gotta end strong. Yeah, some legal what do you think about this mic around, Nico? <laughs> by the way, I'm Drew Corson. I work at Niner Boucher. Um, Thank you for watching, Nico. Um, but yeah, I promise not to do an API demo, but uh, you know, if I do any demos, it'll be three minutes or less. <laughs> so thank you again, Nico Redox.